of this year. It was announced that the existing chair of the Blackpool uh, Hospi Teaching Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust, Ian Johnson, would be stepping down at Easter. Uh, a man I'd always found approachable and helpful in the regular meetings I'd had with him to discuss the Trust's work. And for the avoidance of doubt, I should say, of course, that though, although the Trust is in the constituency of the Honourable Member Blackpool North and Clevelands, who is sitting on the front bench opposite, it does, of course, cover uh, not just my constituencies, but the constituencies of uh, members for filed um, uh, Preston, uh, 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 Preston North and Wire and Lancaster and Fleetwood. So when it was subsequently announced um, that he had applied to become chair of the Morecambe Bay Trust, I was mildly surprised but thought nothing more of it than that. So I was interested, as I'm sure others were, when we were initially encouraged to receive an email from the Secretary of the Trust, including myself and neighbouring MPs, uh, encouraging us to uh, go forward and talk about the process for his successor. But I had no inkling then of the sequence of events that would lead me to seek this adjournment debate today. What began to concern me was the extraordinarily short period of time we were given in terms of um, circulating this information. Um, and so I did write to the Secretary of the Trust and asked why we had not been given earlier notice of the fact. Um, when I actually uh, found out that the advertisement had been placed in the Times, there was no date for the application on April 16th, and it was a very short period of time. And I said in that that I would like more details on the shortlisting and interviews, the interviewing panel, and I was sure that the Trust would understand how important it would be that there should be a strong transparency in the Trust at a critical appointment in this particular time. And I got a slightly thin but soothing note from Michael Harty, the Governor of the Trust, who announced himself as the Chair of the Nominations Committee and said, let me first of all reassure you about the openness and transparency of the process. He, talk, he took me through the process. Um, he did indeed um, uh, confirm that it was going to be a very speedy process and that a long list of candidates had been presented to the Nomination Committee. It wasn't actually very long, uh, only eight, Mr Deputy Speaker, which makes me wonder why all of them weren't interviewed. But it was then a very short process in terms of presentations to stakeholders and final interviews. So I wrote back to him and said I thought there were still serious questions to be answered, particularly about the fact there was no closing date on the applications, and I asked him if he would list the members of the nomination committee. And I said that I was concerned that it had taken a week to provide me with merely a basic timeline to some of the questions I asked. Um, the second letter I got said, in a rather smooth but slightly condescending fashion, that he was disappointed that the original response did not provide me with all the assurances I was seeking, and as a consequence I found the need to ask further questions. Uh, and, and as for uh, the advertising of the process, he said it was the first time the Trust had taken such a step, and in view of the progression they thought it was be open and transparent to, to let people know about it. Um, uh, I'm sure you recognise its circulation was a well-intentioned act, although the closing date was an obvious piece of detail that could have been included in the email. Well, I began at this point to think that the old proverb that the louder he protested his honour, the faster we counted the spoons. And I can only... I said to him in response that I didn't think this was very transparent. I asked him who had appointed the nominating committee. He told me that that was appointed by the governors. So I'm still uh, at a... Uh, at a loss to understand why um, there was such a hurry for this shortlist. The other thing that bothered me, frankly, was the inclusion of the Chief Executive of the Trust, Wendy Swift, in the nomination committee, uh, and I laid out my concerns in that respect to my uh, fellow MPs in a letter, an email that I sent them on the 16th of May, where I said the inclusion of the Chief Executive on that committee, who effectively has overseen all aspects of this process, prepared the shortlist of candidates, and will presumably make a recommendation to governors this Friday. I believe that to give any chief executive so prominent a role in the process, as opposed to that person perfectly reasonably, but separately giving thoughts and feedback to it, could be seen as anomalous in the context of the necessary future relationship of the new chair to the chief exec. And I said to my fellow MPs that I've taken these steps to question what had gone on with some reluctance and I think for the first time in my 20 years relationship with the Trust, because of my real concerns for the procedure, not for the individuals, because at that stage, neither I nor anybody else knew who had applied or been shortlisted. Um, uh, so I then looked at the Trust's constitution and the Council of Governors' manual, and the Council of Governors' manual made it very clear 
um, that the chief executive was not uh, one of the automatic one of the members of the committee. The role of the Council of Governors, of course, is to hold the executive to account. So she could have had an advisory capacity, but not as a member of it. The trust constitution said that she should be a member. So both of both of them could not be correct. So I wrote again to Mr Harty on the 17th of May and said, look, the Council of Governors is responsible for establishing the nomination committee. It's very clear that the Chair's appointment is their responsibility and the only reference to the Chief Executive occurs in the section on attendance at the nominations committee. It does not give licence to the Chief Executive to sit as a fully-fledged member, determining all the processes, shortlisting candidates, etc., etc., and I asked him, therefore, to think very carefully as to whether this process should be paused and recalibrated, because I believe that there was a significant danger that the clear protocols in the Governor's Manual had been breached. Well, he didn't do that. Um, in fact, uh, what we then got was uh, uh, an email that was sent to Governors by uh, Sue Crouch, who was the lead Governor, uh, saying that although our constitution clearly indicates the chief executive should be a member of the nomination committee, uh, given the feedback from governors, uh, Wendy has graciously offered to withdraw in the best interests of the process. But of course by that time, Mr Deputy Speaker, she'd taken part in three quarters of the process. And whether it was gracious withdrawal or otherwise, I have no knowledge. Um, so that was not a very good situation in which to be. Um, I had become concerned about the situation and with the Trust, and I had therefore written to NHS Improvement, and I wrote to them to ask the same sorts of questions and what their role should be. I initially got back a letter uh, from uh, uh, the Chief Executive, not the Chief Executive, I, I beg your pardon, from the Director for the North Region, Lynn Simpson, um, who said to me in her letter, um, that NHS improvement is not involved in the recruitment of chairs of Foundation Trusts, which of course was not what I had asked her. Uh, the Trust had given their assurances that this recruitment process was in line with the Constitution, open, transparent and government-led, but she didn't give any grounds for that advice. So I went back to her, I reminded her that uh, I'd had guidance from the House of Commons Library that Foundation Trusts are accountable to Monitor, which is now part of NHS improvement, I looked at the Code of Governance published by Monitor and it specifically referred to the appointment of chairs and I therefore asked her to, to respond more fully. She did respond again but then said there was no legal basis upon which the NHS improvement could intervene in the appointment of a Foundation Trust chair. Um, I did not find that very acceptable but I did note that she said that Dr Kirker uh, his recent governance report, published in February 2018, had highlighted the role imp NHS improvement plays in board appointments as not sufficiently clear. Um, very briefly, because I have not much time. Wait, uh, 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 quite clearly, if a procedure has not been followed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and, and the honourable gentleman has outlined that, surely at some stage he has to refer this to the local government ombudsman. Because if you want to get action for the procedure not being followed, surely that must be one way of doing it. It might be, but I'm hoping that the minister. Well, I'm hoping that the minister this evening might be able to make some comments on some of the issues um, that have been brought forward. Because NHS improvement uh, does have to fulfil its duties in legislation, and I don't believe that they had done that very well. In, in effect, uh, I then got another letter saying, "I'm pleased the trust has responded positively to the concerns you've raised on this point." Well, really, that was a question of shutting the door after the horse had bolted for the reasons that I've explained. I then wrote again asking for a response from Mr Harty and I didn't get that, but I did get a reply from Sue Crouch. And Sue Crouch told me that at the meeting um, to confirm the candidates, uh, uh, to confirm the candidate who was going to be presented, who turned out to be Mr Pierce Butler, who just coincidentally um, uh, had just stepped down as chair of the Morecambe Bay Trust to which the chair, uh, former chair of the Blackpool Trust was about to go uh, and I was told in that process um, by that, uh, uh, I finally, finally got to see the minutes of the process that the discussion panels had worked well, however there had been a difference of opinion about the candidates. Um, but I was also then told uh, by a number of people that the proceedings at the 
confirmation were rather irregular because not only did the chair Michael Hartley, according to them, this is governors, ignore the request from three governors for a secret vote, he said that its pretensions would count as a yes vote, which struck me as a rather strange position in which to be. And for obvious reasons, because the trust has larded around lots of confidentials and highly confidentials uh, on their various things, I'm not going to name the governors who have uh, spoken to me, although they're perfectly prepared to talk to people about it. I just quote what one governor said. A few governors, including the chief executive, were included in the recruitment process. The rest of us were asked to attend presentations and panels as part of it. I requested on a number of occasions the criteria and waiting for the presentations of the panels, including set questions. These were not sent. At the presentation, pe pieces of paper presented on which we made unstructured comments. They were supposed to be weighted, but no criteria to do so. Candidates were questioned at each panel, but no questions were preset in advance. We were asked to choose a candidate based on their activities. There was disagreement from a number of people about the preferred candidate for the chair. At the Council of Governors meeting called to ratify the appointment, there was discussion about the process and the selection. A paper ballot was refused and a show of hands insisted on. Um, um, I also have uh, a, a further comment uh, from someone who, again, will remain nameless, but was a senior uh, manager at uh, Blackpool Vic and in other organisations of the past, and he wrote to me and said, the Council of Governors has always been viewed as an inconvenient necessity rather than a valued part of the Trust's governance arrangement. So that I found very, very disturbing and concerning, Mr Deputy Speaker. And you might have thought at that stage that the Trust, and certainly the Nomination Committee, would have paused for thought, given all these criticisms from uh, the Governors. Um, but again, we have had a process for an, the appointment of a new uh, non-executive director, uh, uh, clinical director. Um, again, there were two panels of candidates, um, uh, um, which included, again, the chief executive, Wendy Swift. Uh, I understand the chair designate was president on this occasion as well. Panel one, uh, let's call the two candidates X and Y. Panel one had preferred candidate X by four votes to two. Panel uh, two had uh, also gone for the other candidate unanimously, but the nominations committee had recommended uh, candidate Y. And it's not surprising, therefore, um, that many of the trust governors um, uh, have so far not gone back to ratify this appointment um, in any shape or form. Um, those are some of the issues uh, that uh, have come out of this. And I just want to make one or two observations in conclusion. Um, the chair of any health trust is crucially important, particularly in these difficult circumstances that Blackpool uh, Teaching Hospital finds itself still requiring improvement, according to CQC, hit hard by pressures of morbidity, the impact of transience and demography, which put extra pressures on. We need, therefore, the processes for the appointment of a chair or non-executive director to be as transparent and reaching out as possible, not one that's a cosy old pals act reinforced by groupthink, which has come up sometimes through the bureaucracy. I'm forced to conclude that the nominations committee thought that they could get away with evading proper scrutiny and transparency, and they thought that a thin veneer of irritated politeness uh, attempting to conceal a, suspect, a determined effort to override public governors unless they were rubber stamps, and indeed delay to block out others such as myself from uh, uh, discussing these things, um, would do the trick. Well, it doesn't do the trick, um, and it's frankly an insult to all the hard-working staff who have worked their socks off in the past few months in recent uh, uh, crises at Blackpool Victoria Hospital. Um, the use of the words confidential and highly confidential um, by the lead governor, Sue Crouch, could be seen as an attempt to intimidate or to gag governors who had legitimate concerns about the process. And I'm very concerned about that. And I have to say also, I have circulated, as I say, this letter to um, all my uh, neighbouring MPs. And my colleague, the member for Lancaster and Fleetwood, is unable to be here today, but she asked specifically. Uh, for me to indicate that she shares my concerns on this governance at the hospital. And I understand also that the Honourable Member for Files, who is away from Parliament, has also said that he has a number of issues with the uh, 
with the governments. So what I would ask the Minister to reflect on tonight is whether we need some form of inquiry into the process that went on at Blackwall Hospital Trust. And I, I can assure him that some of the governors who have shared the concerns that I have are prepared to give evidence on that part. Some clarity as to the role of NHS improvement, because NHS improvement is supposed to be a backstop to addressing both stakeholder and individual concerns. But in this instance, it seemed all too ready to accept the version of events from the way that the people who had convened all of this wanted them to go. The principle that governors should not feel pressured or fettered and that if the government is very important and if the government wants to encourage democratic involvement in the NHS, a real people's NHS in its 70th uh, year, there is a lot more to do to support and enable them and secure those rights to represent. And members of parliament who raise legitimate issues of transparency should be able to get proper answers. I have no idea if uh, Mr Piers Butler, who was announced as the new chair on May the 18th, will be a, a good, a bad or an indifferent chair of the Blackpool Trust. But what I am clear about is that the process which has appointed him was deeply flawed and not transparent. Minister Bartley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. May I begin by thanking the Honourable Gentleman and the Member for Blackpool South for bringing this debate. Uh, and I'm also pleased to see my honourable friend, the member for Blackpool North and Cleveleys, in his place. Uh, and I know, as uh, the honourable gentleman referred, both the member for Fylde and the member for Lancaster Fleetwood have also expressed an interest in the issues before the House this evening. This, the issues raised in this debate by the honourable member are clearly a cause for concern. While the CQC has not identified any governance issues in the Trust, it is clear that the recruitment process for the new chair had a number of irregularities. One of the defining features of our approach to the NHS since the Francis report has been a willingness to face up to difficult issues. I therefore welcome the opportunity to focus on these irregularities and will address each in turn. The previous chair of the trust resigned in January 2018 to take up a role as the chair of another nearby foundation trust, University Hospitals Morecambe Bay. This caused a recruitment process for the Chair of Blackpool Teaching Hospitals Foundation Trust to commence in February this year. Autonomy in appointing executives is an important NHS Foundation Trust freedom, and as a Foundation Trust, Blackpool Teaching Hospitals Foundation Trust has the freedom to determine many of its own policies and procedures, including those relating to the appointment of a new Chair. The process followed by Blackpool is explained in the Trust's own constitution, which sets out the makeup of the nominations committee responsible for senior appointments. This committee is made up of six individuals, including the chair, or another senior role if the chair is in a position that is being recruited. Three governors and the chief exec. The sixth member is an independent assessor, in this case the chair from another foundation trust, Salford Royal. This is, Mr Deputy Speaker, where the first irregularity arises. NHSI guidance states that a Foundation Trust Chief Executive should not be permitted to vote on the appointment of the Chair, to whom he or she will be accountable. However, in this case, the Chief Executive was on the Nominations Committee for this role. While she did not breach the guidance, it is clear to me that if a Chief Executive should not vote on the appointment of a Chair, then it follows that a Chief Executive should also not be involved earlier in the appointments process given the relationship of accountability that exists between the Chief Executive and Chairs of NHS Trusts and Foundation Trusts. However, I do recognise that it, this instruction was deep within guidance dating from 2012, uh, and there have been other pieces of NHS guidance to Foundation Trusts regarding their governance arrangements that do not contain similar advice. There is an expectation, Mr Deputy Speaker, that advice and guidance given to NHS Trusts is clear and understandable. I have been informed that the guidance on this topic is currently being refreshed by NHSI Improvement as part of the review of the role of board appointments, uh, as the Honourable Gentleman referred, following Dr Kirkup's findings in relation to Liverpool Community Trust. And I have asked for the lessons to be learnt uh, and fed into this refresh. The Chief Executive did voluntarily stand back from the process after concerns were raised by the Honourable Gentleman regarding her involvement in this process. 
This was before the final interview was held for any of the candidates. Though it may be fair to ask if involving the Chief Executive in the recruitment of the Chair was the wisest course of action, it was within the Trust's constitution. Mr Deputy Speaker, the second irregularity is a response from NHS improvement to the Honourable Member's letter of 3rd May, which fails to refer to their own guidance regarding the need to ensure the Chief Executive is not permitted to vote on the appointment of a Chair to whom he or she is accountable. This is regrettable, and I understand that NHS Improvement will write again to the Honourable Member to apologise for this error. Mr Deputy Speaker, the third irregularity highlighted is the speed of the process. The Nominations Committee engaged recruitment consultant Gayton B. Sanderson to provide professional services during the recruitment process. Part of this process involved emailing local MPs to inform them that the recruitment process was taking place. However, as the Honourable Member has highlighted, there was little time between this email being sent and the closing date for applications, a total of 10 working days over the Easter holiday period. The email also did not include the closing date for applications, further hampering MPs' ability to contribute effectively to the process. I understand that the recruitment process began in February and concluded in May, with the new chair in post from 1st June this year. The recruitment company has confirmed that this process has been run to a standard time frame. This therefore raises the question of why this local engagement, an important part of the overall appointments process, appears to have been rushed in this instance. There are clearly lessons to be learnt here, and I will be working with NHSI to see to ensure that their guidance is refreshed uh, and that it is clear in its advice to Foundation Trusts and Trusts in terms of the importance of local engagement. In his letter to the Trust of 17th May, the Honourable Member referenced the Trust Council Manual, pointing out that it did not include any reference to the Chief Executive sitting on the nominations panel. This document sits under the Constitution of the Trust, and I am satisfied that the explicit rules addressed, addressing this matter in the Constitution have been followed. I have today received a personal assurance from the Trust Chief Executive, Wendy Swift, that the Trust will review its Constitution to remove any ambiguity in respect to the appointment of the Chair on non-executive directors. And just to reassure the Honourable Gentleman, if I read directly from that letter, which states, I would like to reassure you, uh, as in myself, that we had already taken a decision to review our Constitution to remove any ambiguity in respect to the appointment of the Chair and non-executives. And I'll happily share that letter with the Honourable Gentleman. The independent assessor on the panel was the Chair of Salford Royal NHS Foundation Trust. He agreed with the candidate recommended by the Nominations Committee's interview panel to the Council of Governors and has not raised objections with how the process to recruit the new Chair was run. I have also had a personal assurance from the Chief Executive that there has been no contact between herself and the Chair of Salford Royal NHS Foundation Trust and that she has not tried to influence the decision-making process leading up to the Chair's appointment in any way. Uh, in the Chief Executive's letter to me dated 27th June, she also goes on to say, and it's helpful just to quote to the House, I did know the new Chair on a professional basis prior to his appointment. We had worked with the, within the same health authority economy on, for a number of years, and attended the same strategic meetings and events. For clarity, the Chair was the Chief Executive of the Strategic Health Authority 2002-06, whilst I was the Chief Executive of Blackpool PCT. After 2006, there were no personal or professional links until the Chair was appointed as the Chair of University Hospitals Morecambe Bay 2014-2018. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is clearly difficult to reconcile the involvement of the Chief Executive in the process to select chairs with the principles of good governance. This appointment took place under the systems of Foundation Trust autonomy, put in place under successive governments, and is currently a matter for the Foundation Trust themselves. However, NHSI recognises that the role it plays in board appointments, both executive and non-executive, is not sufficiently clear and that there would be a benefit in reviewing and codifying its oversight and support arrangements. 
While any such changes should pay due regard to the fact that autonomy in appointing executives is an important NHS Foundation Trust freedom, I can assure the House that I will be working with NHSI to ensure that the irregularities regarding this appointment do not occur in the future. And therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman has done the House a service this evening in highlighting what were clear irregularities in respect of this appointment. Uh, and I hope my response goes some way to reassuring him that NHS improvement will work with the Department to ensure that further irregularities do not occur. Order, order. The host is now adjourned. House of Commons Sound House of Commons Sound The proceed